All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So I, I want to start off with a joke, and I uh, did not warn my co-presenter about this joke ahead of time. So uh, what did the IDP have on its coffee in the morning? Ooh, I, I don't know. Skim milk. Oh. Ew. <laughs> All right, I got another one. What's the hardest part about making skim milk? Um, so we have something to do with a cow. <laughs> Skipping the cow across the lake. Mm. <laughs> there you go. There's your tie-in between skim and animals. So we'll be talking about what's new in the zoo, though sadly no cows in our slides today. Yep. Uh, uh, but we will talk about what's new in the zoo with skim. All right, we'll talk about who the heck we are and why we're up here talking uh, about Skim. We'll talk about what is Skim, though if you were in the last session, you, heard, you got a great intro from Janelle and Ching Wen. We'll talk about what's coming new in the zoo, and last and most importantly, we will reiterate what you can do to help. So who the heck are we? I am Paul Lanzi. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Remediant. That is actually not a picture of me. Uh, you could be mistaken. That is a picture of my dog, Winston, and just like Ian in his keynote yesterday, I needed to find some egregious use of a dog picture, of my dog picture in my presentation, so that's where you get it. Um, he is actually not the Winston the French Bulldog that won the Westminster Dog Show yesterday. So those of you that have that DVR, sorry for ruining that surprise, but uh, good news for, for French Bulldogs all around the world. Uh, and then my name is Danny Zollner. Uh, I am a senior product manager at Microsoft, and uh, I manage a bunch of the things surrounding our Skim client and how we uh, as an IDP, interact with uh, all of the uh, Skim service providers out there in the world. All right, so what the heck is Skim? So uh, it's actually a collection of three different documents. Janelle and Chingwen talked about a couple of these uh, just now, but really the one that most people care about is the middle one, the REST API. This actually defines the HTTP verbs and the uh, API endpoints you can use to interact with identity objects. The object model schema goes into more detail about those things, and the use cases, which we'll be talking more about later, gives you some examples about how Skim actually gets used in the real world every day. Um, at the end of the day, Skim's all about exchanging identity information between systems, right? And, and 15 years or 11 years ago when Skim started, that was a minor problem. Today, it is a major problem. Uh, today is a major problem. And so being able to accurately exchange identity information between systems is exactly the reason for Skim. All right, so did you use Skim today? So who thinks you use Skim today? Good, well, if you opened the mobile application for this conference today, you used Skim today. <laughs> if you manage enterprise applications, you probably used Skim today. If you set up um, you know, Instagram 4.0 as a new application, you probably used Skim today. And if you are a customer of a bank that recently merged with another bank and they're keeping their data in synchronization between each other, you probably used Skim today. Um, Skim is just such a common standard that doesn't get a lot of love. Uh, let's talk about how much it's actually used. Yeah, and it's, um, it's one of those things where it's, it's used a lot out on the internet. It's, you know, it's an HTTP REST-based standard, but uh, a lot of uh, organizations, applications, you know, have adopted it for their own internal use, you know, what, just on their internet as well. Because if you can build the same standard internally, it's a lot easier when you're trying to then use it externally. So who else is using it? Uh, so, shockingly, anything where uh, people can implement it locally or on the internet, it's a little hard to get accurate numbers because uh, you, know, you don't really know who's doing what on-prem uh, or you know, anywhere about the internet. But uh, just you know, looking sort of out at the internet, um, if you're trolling around through you know, API documentation, there's easily 500 plus uh, implementations of Skim. Uh, it's a pretty heavy balance, um, you know, probably like 90, 10, maybe that's being you know, a little generous towards the 10 where uh, it's Skim service providers implementing. So you're implementing the API endpoints uh, so that uh, Skim clients, whether it's you know, uh, something that somebody's independently wrote or uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the major offerings out there in the identity world, uh, so that they can talk to your service and uh, give you identity information. Uh, if you then sort of scale out across all these implementations, how many organizations are using it? Well, it's, you know, again, easily 100,000 plus enterprises are using it in some form or fashion just by virtue of using these other services that are using Skim. If you then you know, sort of keep drilling down, easily you know, 500 million plus users, just all these different services, it's, it's, it's made its mark on the world already. Uh, and then, honestly, the, the API calls, going back to things around, you know, nobody can actually know. Um, it's got to be way past 100 billion. Uh, we're sort of just thinking of it at this point, uh, the, the thing that McDonald's eventually started doing with their sign, and it's just billions and billions and billions, or probably trillions, of calls, like real, I think we're at the point where we're getting hundreds of billions, if not, you know, maybe a, a trillion calls a week, or, or sorry, a, a week in Skim, just with you know how much identity data is getting shuffled around places. Yeah, in fact, Danny will make the very bold claim 
that your data, your identity data, probably traversed a skim interface at some point today. If it hasn't already, it will later today. I'm pretty sure about it. So uh, it is way out there. It is one of the most used standards. It's actually evolved a lot. It has. Uh, so on that topic, we're going to talk about the evolution of skim. Uh, so if we start looking at the before times, like what was the world like before skim? Uh, so it's just this smattering of different ideas, uh, some standardized, some proprietary, of how to shuffle identity information around. So you had things like DSML, SPML, uh, various federated or virtual directories, and a whole bunch of mostly proprietary REST APIs. Uh, that, of course, is horrible for the, you know, the problem of scale. How do you build something once and then go use it 100 times? Uh, it's a lot of development effort. So uh, people identified that problem, and in December of 2011, uh, SCIM 1.0 was uh, sort of you know, published and adopted. And so that introduced concepts like a slash discovery endpoint, so you could find out you know, all the things about the, uh, the SCIM server or service provider that you're talking to, uh, the slash user endpoint, slash group, uh, you know, sort of the concept of that RESTful identity uh, in the format of uh, sort of a, a vCard-ish uh, JSON object. Uh, it was missing some things like uh, multi-value operations. Uh, so, you know, Iterative process uh, through 2014, 2015, uh, Skim Working Group uh, got back together. Uh, between 1.0 and 2.0, it moved uh, and became managed by uh, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And uh, when Skim 2.0 was published, uh, it added things like a slash bulk endpoint, so you can send one post request and do 100 things rather than 100 separate REST API requests. Uh, added you know, support for... Uh, I guess things like a value path where you can start drilling in on uh, complex attributes and say, you know, I want only email addresses that are of type equals work. I don't care about their personal email address. Um, and, uh, you know, some other things, a robust uh, sort of like a, a rules uh, thing inside of an, an expression system. Uh, it was missing some stuff still. Uh, robust rules. Yeah, robust. <laughs> um, but, you know, everybody does as well as they can at the time. You know, we, we learn things as we do them. Uh, so things like uh, UI paging, or you might also refer to that as uh, cursor-based pagination. Uh, right now, Skim only has index-based pagination. Uh, so you know, say, give me results one through ten. Well, what if one of your results in you know the next page of like eleven through twenty changes and actually becomes result number five? Well, you already read the first page. Now it's on the first page. You miss it forever unless you read it again. Uh, and then things you know, multi-cloud coordination and uh, sub-attribute extensions. There are complex attributes that. Uh, have, you know, sub-attributes like value and display name or whatever, and well, what if you want to extend the schema, but you actually just want to extend a sub-attribute of one of these already defined, like, core attributes? So it's, you know, the, 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 more, people, uh, the more that people implemented in all these, uh, you know, you started hitting all the edge cases. There's, you know, things that you find out when in practice. Which is why we're coming up with skim v.next. We haven't decided exactly what skim v.next is going to be officially named. It could be the official instantiation of 2.0. It could be 2.1. It could be 3.0. That's one of the things that you get to participate in if you join our skim working group. But whatever the skim v.next is, it'll solve these problems and all the problems that Janelle and Chingwen just talked about and more and more. Yeah. And even just through the last few years, um, like interest was already starting to build with uh, you know, enhancing skim further. Uh, but as the pandemic came upon the world, uh, it was uh, just incredibly important for almost every organization out there to, um, in a lot of cases, move their identity information uh, for their entire company from you know, whatever their main like, central you know, corporate directory is into a, a whole slew of uh, like collaboration applications so that everybody could go from working in the office to working remote. And Skim got a, got a huge like, uh, you know, sort of boost in usage and uh, a stress test there. Uh, as the entire world try to move their identity information very rapidly to uh, you know, protect their employees and everything like that. So what you're saying is the pandemic wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Skim. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so that is one of the drivers of change, though, is the fact that we have so many more systems of record out there today. So uh, we went from, on average, you know, three or four cloud solutions to, in some cases, more than a dozen. Uh, in some organizations, even more than that. So the fact that identities are now distributed across multiple different cloud solutions is a huge adopter, or it's a huge driver of uh, need to improve Skim. In fact, Danny and I were doing a little back of the envelope math last night, and with the fact that there are literally billions and billions of Skim API calls done every day, if we can improve the efficiency of these cloud solutions synchronizing identity data between them, it could actually have a small but markable Im you know, impact on the energy use in, this, in, the, in the world. It's like it is used that extensively. 
There's also a lot of coming out around privacy requirements. I'm sure everyone in this room who's an identity practitioner has facing identity privilege, uh, sorry, identity privacy requirements uh, in your day jobs. And so today, there isn't a lot about least privilege built into the SKIM standards. A lot about making data available, but not about a lot about restricting it. And so building in some of those capabilities into the standard is something we're interested in doing. Um, and then you heard it, uh, Andre talk about this in the keynote yesterday. There's just more, more of everything, more identities, more APIs, more users. Uh, more cloud solutions, so trying to deal with that. And then last, trying to tie in some better security uh, into the standard. So uh, we talked, uh, or you heard Janelle talk a little bit about security events. Um, uh, there's a lot that I think we can do there, and there's also some challenges around the way that uh, SCIM clients and servers are currently authenticated that will, will improve. Indeed. So that leads us to the, really the big question, and our uh, name of the thing, what's new in Azure with SCIM? So there's a couple of things. The first one we talked about is scale, security. We talked about some updated schema, so that's one of Danny's passion areas around schemas. He doesn't look like a passionate guy around schemas, but, but truly he is, he's hiding it right now. Uh, tools for advanced automation and some other improvements. Yeah, so on, on the topic of scale, uh, I already mentioned a few minutes ago, but uh, you know, cursor-based pagination. Uh, if you're trying to go through, uh, you know, let's say hundreds of thousands, or, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of records, and you want to have trust that you've actually seen the whole set of records and that things haven't accidentally shifted around and you missed a couple of things, uh, index pagination, uh, or, or rather index-based pagination, is just unfortunately not up to the, the, the job. And so, uh, yeah, cursor-based pagination, there's been a draft written for it, you know, I think in 2017, but it never really picked up steam, probably because the SCIM working group had disbanded and nobody was there to you know, receive it. Um, but now that we have the working group recharted, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's time, right? Um, and so that, that'll allow um, you know, a lot of uh, sort of more, um, kind of, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like more uh, trust in the, um, in, in the data that's being gotten. And so you can have these uh, sort of like higher uh, uh, importance uh, uh, situations. Uh, there's some other problems that also you know, align with scale. Uh, so right now, uh, like multi-value attributes, let's say members of a group, probably the most prominent example. Uh, if you have a group with a million members, there's no way to break that up. If you, if you say get group, uh, there's no way to actually get that broken up into pieces. So according to standard, you're going to get one gigantic response. And uh, hopefully whatever system you have on the other end catching that has uh, you know, whatever in, built in place to uh, you know, take and then probably like deserialize the million records that you're gonna get, right? Uh, otherwise, things are gonna break or catch on fire. Um, and just, again, you know, scale, um, reliability, uh, the ability to go and call an endpoint uh, and say, I want all of the objects that have changed, you know, maybe with a filter, you know, uh, I want all of the email addresses of type equals work that have changed since the last time I asked you about this. So you can go and, you know, just get the last, you know, six hours worth of changes instead of having to, you know, pull them all and then compare against your own records. It's, it allows, uh, you know, everybody to be a little more efficient. You don't have to send as much over the wire. We also are planning to remove the capability to do basic auth. So embarrassingly, the vast majority of SCIM clients and servers, yes, I see, I see applause and smiles in the audience. The vast majority of SCIM clients and servers today authenticate using nothing more complicated than simple auth and bearer tokens. So we definitely, it is possible to do OAuth-based authentication with SCIM today, but making that the standard and improving the security around authentication between SCIM clients and servers, definitely something we want to improve. Um, shockingly, there is a password attribute <laughs> in the user schema today. 11 years ago, that probably made a lot of sense. Now, much less so to be able to synchronize users' passwords between systems. There are much better ways of doing that. Um, and you just, I won't repeat it, but Janelle and Chingwen did an awesome job talking about all the things we want to improve around the active attribute uh, that exists as a Boolean today in the user schema. And last, we want to enhance the, oh, actually, you want to talk about this one? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about this one. So uh, there's reference attributes in Skim, uh, like the user uh, profile picture or photo attribute is probably the best example where um, the, the standard says, just give a URL. So, you know, HTTP, whack, whack, my picture, or my user's picture. And there's nothing in the standard that talks about securing that picture. Uh, so there's, no, there's nothing standardized of how to tell, because, um, you know, Skim is you know, heavily used for like, cross-internet communications. Uh, on an intranet, you know, you, you, your firewall rules are probably sufficient, right? But on, on the internet, you either have to do some sort of bespoke thing that's not standardized, which defeats some of the purpose, or um, you just, what, you're gonna put all of your company's, let's say, user profile pictures up on the internet and make them anonymously authenticatable? It seems like a, like a, a Fisher's or some sort of you know, uh, social engineer. Might know. be some privacy problems. Yeah, it's a, it's a privacy problem. Uh, so we, we wanna figure out a solution so that 
the, the client and the server can do you know, some sort of exchange so that the server knows, okay, when I go back to read this, uh, this picture, this is the token or you know, what, this is the, the method I use to actually tell them I'm trusted and I should have this access. Um, and then just to you know, sort of double click on um, some of the earlier points that Paul's talking about, the things like removing basic auth, things like removing password, proposals, you know, nothing's actually finalized yet, but uh, we're, we're very much in favor of uh, bringing Skim forward when it comes to security. Yep. And uh, yeah, as Paul said, I love schemas. Um, so there's a couple new scenarios that, um, that were, uh, you know, as a, sort of the working group, uh, it's you know, the collective working group, we, um, are looking at uh, adding new schemas for just to standardize. So the human resources scenario, like uh, just show of hands, uh, how many people uh, here, uh, do you, you're pretty sure your company uh, uses your human resources uh, like platform as one of or your only source of truth initially in the hiring process? Yeah, that's a lot of hands. I'd be, I'd be surprised what else they're using as the source of truth, for the, but maybe yeah. something else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> systems. Yeah. Uh, so we, we want to have a sort of you know standard schema of you know the majority. If we can get ninety percent of the the common data that's uh, you know thrown around between HR providers, and represent that in a standardized way, so everybody calls an apple an apple, and you know a, a dog a dog, then we can. Uh, you know, it, it just it makes interoperability so much easier because you can uh, you know write one thing and plug it into 20 different HR providers rather than having to learn about the intricacies of all of them. And then you know the HR providers can do their own little schema extensions afterward. They can get you know that 10% that doesn't fall into the normal um, you know into that new schema, but it makes interop you know 10% of the work versus 100%. Uh, there's also the enterprise group schema. Uh, for anybody familiar with the schema spec right now, the uh, the, the schema for groups has, uh, outside of the common attributes like ID that every object has, it has two attributes, which is display name and members. So, you know, most complex organizations probably also keep track of uh, things like, oh, I, I don't know, uh, who owns the group and who, you know, has the permissions to manage it, right? So there, there's all these things that, uh, you know, sort of organizational operations uh, would really like to be able to transmit in a standardized way over skim. Yep. Next one is privilege access management. So there's been a skim PAM spec out there uh, sort of floating in the world, adopted by a few for a while, but it's pretty limited. Like it works okay for password vault solutions, but doesn't really work for anything beyond that. And so bringing some concepts like just-in-time access and the ability to understand entitlements around privilege access into the skim PAM spec, or sorry, into the skim spec, into the core spec is something we're also working on. Yeah, and then the, the final bullet point here is new resource types. So, uh, you know, identity information, it, like I, is, it's so much more than just users and groups. Uh, so, you know, users have, just in this, even using uh, Skim as an example, there's attributes like roles and entitlements. So it's like, what roles can my user have? What entitlements can they have? You know, it's things like, like licenses or things like, things like that. Well, wouldn't it be really helpful if you could go and, say, query a list and actually find out what all the valid roles are in the system or what all the valid entitlements are? Otherwise, you're just sort of, you either have to go, you know, manually look at some other list that's not through the Skim standard, uh, so you can't do it programmatically, or you've uh, got to just sort of guess and trial and error and you know, let's see, okay, does the, the service provider reject you or do they accept the value? It's not efficient, right? Um, so there's some resources like that. There's uh, some other things that have been brought up, uh, you know, devices. You know, most users have at least one device. So why not start you know, representing that data, they're att usually attached to users, uh, so that you can you know, get the whole landscape. Um, and then there's you know, even just things like domains. As a company, you know, if, if I run, uh, you know, uh, the company uh, Contoso, well, it, it'd be good for me to be able to say through Skim, uh, well, you know, the only, uh, you know, domain names that this application will accept are, you know, at Contoso.com. So if you try and create a user with, you know, at something else, I don't know, at Identiverse.com, you're, you're not going to be able to do it because we don't own the domain. So there's also some cool stuff coming for advanced automation. So Skim is almost always used in an automated sense. So being able to discover things like client and negotiate client credentials, attribute mappings between clients and servers to understand how different uh, fields are used and what they're called on to, between the client and the server, and then even be able to do some per attribute schema negotiation so that if you don't want to support the entire HR schema, you don't want to expose all that data to a certain Skim client, you can just expose portions of it, uh, which also helps privacy and also helps security as well. Yeah, like just uh, as an example, Paul and I were talking yesterday. Uh, let, let's say that you're in sort of a high trust environment, and, you're, um, and whether it's part of the HR schema that everybody standardizes or it's an extension, uh, maybe you're communicating between systems and you're including things like, I don't know, uh, salary information. Well, um, you, you can sort of advertise maybe in this schema that it, you know, the, the data exists, but there, there should be a negotiation process. So you can say, well, you know, you're like, I don't know, our, our travel vendor. Uh, you can learn certain things like the employee's cost center, but you don't need to know how much they make. 
Yeah. So being able to, again, you know, programmatically uh, like start splitting hairs and say you get this but not this is, uh, is a thing that's uh, really good for like data security. Yeah, and I won't repeat it, but Janelle and Chingwen talked a lot about security events. There is so much we can do with this. This is really cool for uh, signaling changes from either the client side or the server side to then say, hey, something has changed about this identity, you need to go resynchronize it, instead of having to start the entire synchronous entire aggregation from, from the start again. And then thinking about some enhanced schema properties around data visibility, data source of authority. We all have so much in our identities that come from different data sources. Uh, and then thinking about things like value reference location. Yeah, um, so value reference location. Let's use, uh, I don't know, manager as an example. So it's, it's written in a paragraph somewhere in the skim spec where it says uh, the value for the manager attribute should be the ID value of another user. But there's other things. You know, let, let's go back to the example of roles or I don't know, let's talk about something else, like new, like a, a cost center. Well, uh, let, let's say that you've got a slash cost centers resource you know, in your schema, and so you're listing out for anybody interacting with your endpoint, oh, these are all the cost centers that I have. Well, how in a programmatic sense can you communicate and say, well, the cost center attribute on the user is actually, it needs to be a value from over here. Because uh, again, otherwise you have to start looking at documentation that's not in Skim, and you're just, you know, it's a pain. It's not, you can't do it you, programmatically, you can't scale, you know. We, we, we like that. Data quality is never a problem. What are you talking about? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> exactly. Uh -oh. So uh, then uh, one of the final things we'll talk about here is uh, a revamped use cases document. So uh, earlier in the, in the presentation, we had that list of the three RFCs. Uh, the schema and the protocol are, um, I don't know, the, the meat and potatoes. Um, honestly, for about my first two years working with Skim, I didn't realize that there was a use cases RFC. <laughs> um, but it, it was written in 2015. It, aligned with you know, what everybody knew then. Uh, and we, we've learned things in seven years. Uh, so the, the, the goal here is to sort of like revamp the use cases document with modern, you know, uh, uh, what is it, the 2020s decade learnings from the, from the internet and the cloud and all those things. So just, you know, you know, we wanna cover some best practices that we've learned since then, uh, give some updated examples uh, now that we have, uh, again, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of Skim implementations out there, and you know, we, we've learned what not to do. Uh, add more consistent language. Uh, there's some terms that are mentioned in the, uh, the protocol and the schemas RFCs that you don't actually ever see in the use cases. Um, and you know, they maybe talk about them using other words, but again, standardization, let's make everything the same. Uh, and then closer alignment with the schema and protocol RFCs. It's a little, you know, uh, like the thing we are just talking about, but you know, align, you know, make it more cohesive and make it, you know, all together. Yeah, we'll actually hope that in the future, Skim implementers will start with the use case document to understand what is Skim really good at use it, being used for, and then going into the protocol spec and understanding how to actually implement those use cases. Exactly. Yeah. So what comes next? Uh, only good things. So we want you to join our zoo. <laughs> so just like Janelle and Jingwen said, we have a Skim mailing list. You, everyone in the world is welcome to join it. It costs zero dollars to participate and we would love to get your input. Um, this is a link tree, and on the link tree, you can also find our links to our GitHub where we have drafts of some of the standards we've talked about today. It's also a link to our Slack group that you can join, so if you wanna have some real-time conversations, uh, you're welcome to come join our Slack group. I want to do a special shout out to Nancy, who's in our audience today. Nancy, raise your hand. Nancy uh, is our super, super brave, um, Chair? Chair. Chair. Uh, co chair. Chair. And I, I think I saw our other co chair, Aaron, somewhere. Okay, yeah, with oh, Anne right back there. Aaron. Sorry. Of OAuth fame. Yes. Uh, so those are also awesome people for you to talk to. Uh, you're welcome to talk to Danny and I about Skim. You're welcome to talk to Janelle and Chingwen about Skim. Um, but, uh, and Pam, if she's around somewhere. Yep. I don't know if Pam's around. Um, these are all awesome people to talk to about Skim. If Skim is a thing you wake up every morning caring even a little bit about, we would love to have your participation. And, uh, and, and help. Now there's more you can do. So I, I wrote this part down because it's very important. Okay. So if you want to learn more about identity standards, tomorrow Heather uh, is going to give a talk, okay. Giving Back, How to Contribute Your IIM Knowledge to the World. So definitely check that one out. Heather Flanagan's session on Thursday morning. And then on Friday morning, Heather and Vittorio are doing a, the making of an identity standard. So that'll also be a really cool one. If you want to learn a little bit more about the nuts and bolts about how identity standards like Skim uh, get created. And then if you missed it, you should absolutely go back in time, jump in your time machine, and watch Janelle and Ching Wen's session that happened just before this in this room. So program your, your time machines or watch the video session when it's available from the, uh, from the Interverse website. As, as a, a newbie standards person who sort of just like fell into the IETF accidentally, 
Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for Vittorio's session to the point where I am actually rescheduling my flight to leave so that I can see it, so. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys so much. So I want to do one extra round of applause for Danny. This was his very first ever conference presentation. And I think thank you. nailed it. Oh, thank, thank you, everybody. everybody.